Yes. <clears throat> that I mentioned in my my book about the worldview. I think I must in, inform you that the Muslims the last century or even before that and even the 21st century they have not, never talked about they have never even considered the problem of worldview and, and as a result of which there is no clear what you call understanding about what this worldview is and some of them even misunderstand thinking that since we are speaking in English, the term worldview is something new. Of course, as far as the world is concerned, it is of course originating from Europe, the Germans. They use a term like that, worldview. But this does not mean that the idea of worldview is new. It doesn't mean that. It means that in the past, people don't write about these things because there was no problem. And the ulama of Islam in the past, the learned Muslims, the, the philosophers, the theologians, the uh, legal, the jurists, these people were confronting different problems in the past. And as a result, they, some of these things were not, were not mentioned and written by them in a way in which I have tried to explain in that book. But it is already in their minds. All these things, what worldview is not something uh, outside, the world you exist in the minds of the learners, among the Muslims, among the West also, amongst other civilizations too, the learners amongst them have got a view of what they consider to be real and true, what they consider to be the truth. So because of that, we must understand that there are differences of worldview. Worldview, therefore, it means the vision of reality that appears before your mind's eye. Vision of reality that appears before your mind's eye, meaning the minds of the learner. Of course, the ones who are the public, the common people, they don't necessarily have to sort of uh, detail what you call understanding, detailed vision like the learner. It is up to the learner to have a detailed vision in order that they might be teaching this to the people in general. And as a result, the people in general also, ultimately, they will have the same more or less vision of reality in their minds. Obviously, there are certain fundamental elements that project this worldview in the minds of the Muslims, and especially in those of the learned among the Muslims. First of all, obviously there is the, the, the conception, the idea of God. And then, in the case of Islam and the Muslims, conception, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who the God who describes himself in his words that is the Holy Quran and therefore God the Quran 
is a all fundamental element in the in the projection of worldviews. Then there is, because we mentioned just now, he described himself in the Quran. In the Quran also contains description of, of the nature of man, who we are, where we came from, where we are going to. The Quran also talks about knowledge, but this is the attribute of man. The Quran talks also about his spirit, his soul. The Quran talks also about this uh, whole uh, world of sensible experience, of worlds that are beyond sensible experience also. The Quran speaks about that too. And then also the Quran talks about duties and responsibilities. The Quran talks about history. So in other words, the Quran already contains all these fundamental elements that the learned Muslim must understand. And that in his mind, when he contemplates existence, these things must come into, into play. <clears throat> and then, This worldview, as I said, is different between civilizations. The difference is because of what each civilization considers to be the ultimate truth. It is because of that, therefore, that there is difference. Because every civilization will, will have a different idea about, obviously, about God. <laughs> about man, about, about this world, about many things, yes, about knowledge, about so many things. So it is this that makes the worldview different. Some things are not different, they overlap, but there are some fundamental differences. And these fundamental differences are the ones that I mentioned just now, about God, about the Quran, about man, about uh, all those things that I just uh, mentioned very briefly just now. Now, <clears throat> therefore, if in our deliberation today or any day, now, in the future, even in the past, if our deliberation on matters of knowledge and the sciences, if they are not guided by the revealed word, that means to say by the revelation, by the Quran, for example, for the Muslims, if they are not guided by that, then, then they will, from time to time, find themselves necessary to correct errors, to change, to what they call today by politicians and professors of the social sciences, they will have paradigm shifts. Yes, shifts. Shifting, shifting paradigm, meaning the pattern that things are seen by learned people. Now, if you have paradigm shifts like that, the shifts themselves and the paradigms might not be changing the worldview as a whole. That is provided the people who are involved in that are conscious of what the real worldview is like. Like a jigsaw puzzle, there are many pieces. You see, and you put the pieces there is a picture. Therefore, if you want to change one piece, if it is not very important, it will not change. But if you 
will start changing here, changing there, but then gradually it will not fit. The picture will become different. Some parts will be missing. And what? And because of that, what is called confusion arises, which is what is happening today in the Muslim world. It has been happening already a few hundred years ago among the Muslims due to the internal causes. <clears throat> you remember that in the past the early Muslims, people like Al-Ghazali and others that came after him and some other metaphysicians, they have, they have already understood what the worldview of Islam is. And this is clear from their writings. But then there are some who might not quite understand what these people are saying. They begin to oppose it and to think that what they write is not correct. And they, they say we must just explain things literally. Don't go into things. They always say, and even now you hear some of us say that, well, don't go up to the heaven or the skies. Keep your feet on the earth. In other words, don't just talk about metaphysics. We should be talking about economics. We should be talking about the, the social sciences. Yeah? But political science. Well, that is true. There is no harm in talking about those things. But you cannot speak about politics and political science without understanding the nature of this worldview to see if what you are saying contradicts. And therefore it is, it is the, the role of the learner to understand this. And then already there is a misunderstanding about the Prophet, for example. The Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Already the modernists, the modernists, especially from the beginning from Egypt, or just about 200 years ago, they were already attacking the past, history of the Muslim, and the learning of the Muslim. And they influenced and they influence the thinking of modern Muslims today. And they, their attack on the past was quite violent, quite, quite, uh, quite violent, yes, violent. Now, if you attack the past, your own history, you cut off your own roots, the tree that you want to grow, will not grow properly. The Quran speaks about what, what it calls the goodly tree. The good tree, meaning knowledge. Because the good tree, the Quran says, is uh, the roots are deeply in the ground and uh, the leaves are in the sky. But the Quran also mentioned the stunted tree, the evil tree. It does not produce fruit. It is bitter. It is crooked. It is stunted. <laughs> so now, in other words, you cannot cut your roots. And, and uh, but the Muslims are doing that, the same thing. At least people in the West, although they criticize their past and they break away from the past, but the Western, the roots of the European civilization that they did not cut off, it continues until today. But the Muslim talk about how the, the Arabic language must be, must be, must not be based on roots. Cut off the roots so that it can flow according to them. And by floating, it can, it can, Ex 
accept other ideas and it can develop, you see. The word develop, that is all very interesting because this word is very difficult to find in the Muslim language. Even in Malay, you don't have the word develop in that sense. You say pambangunan, yes? But, but, <laughs> develop, there is no word for that. This is a peculiarly Western concept, especially those in line with what you call the, the secular. I will come to that later, I suppose. But now let us go back to about the Holy Prophet. The Holy Prophet has been misunderstood by these people. Even now, for example, they think that he was just an Arab leader. Just like what the Jahiriya thought, as explained in the Quran, the Jahiriya said, you are a man just like us. Yes. So they are saying, thinking the Prophet is like that. So what has happened to them? The Prophet certainly, he was a man, he was a human. But he himself said, yes, I am a man like you. Ana basharum metluku, he said. But the revelation came to me. The Wahid came to me, and that makes him different. There is a great difference. Now, let me try to give a certain interpretation of some Quranic verses. Lau anzalna adal Quran ala jabadi lau aitahu khashyam mutasabyam min khashyatillah. وَتِلْكَ الْأَمْثَالُ نَدْرِبُهَا لِلْنَاسِ لَهَا لَهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Meaning roughly, if we had sent down the Qur'an upon a mountain, you will see the mountain shaking in fear. And then the Qur'an said this, وَنَدْرِبُهَا الْأَمْثَالُ And we strike this analogy so that you can think about it. Are we thinking about that? Are these people who think about the Holy Prophet talk about that? Now why the Quran speaks about mountain? Mountain already, as you know, all civilizations, the mountain is the place where the gods of the pagan people dwell. The Gunung Gunung. So there is Mount Olympus among the Greeks. We also have the Mahameru, yes, Segunta, Bukit Smutu. And in the only language, the word Gunung sometimes, sometimes applied to some beautiful lady, then the boy says Gunung, it doesn't mean that she is like a mountain. It means she has come down from the mountain, the place of the God. Therefore, it is a Devi, it is a Goddess. <laughs> yeah? um, so, in other words, and yet, for example, that means in the Arabic language and the language of the Quran, this mountain is considered to be some a powerful, a very, a very, well, something that makes you feel extremely inferior when you stand. You know, at its foot, for example, you feel small. It's something powerful, something great. Yes. And yet, for example, this Quran was sent down upon a human being. That that human being is greater than the mountain. Yes, the Holy Prophet, that is to say. is greater than the mountain. And not only that, because of that, it also comes to us, but it has belongs. We and the Quran, although we, we are not the one who actually received the revelation, the Wahi, it was the Prophet. So in other words, Muslims must think the Prophet is not just, uh, that he is a man, he is a human being, but he is not like, like other men in history. Yes? <clears throat> 
And then the Quran itself mentions that he is a spreading light. Siroda Monero, spreading light. That he is Uswatun Hasana, a good example, perfect example. That he is Rahmatan Bil Alamin. Rahmah, of course, does not mean mercy. Actually, it means, because Rahmah means the hero of existence. This is one of Allah's one of Allah's name. It means because of it. Because of that, al alamin existed. There was a hadith, of course, nowadays, hadith, would say for a name. Would say, la ulaka, la maqaraktul aflaq. That kind of hadith. Were it not for you, I will not have created the heavens. In other words, the, the reason for the, the creation and that's why the Prophet himself in another hadith said, I was Prophet when Adam was within water and clay. And then in some other hadith he also said other things. The first thing that God created was the intelligence, the intellect, or the reason. And then also the first thing God created was the light. Now, most of the metaphysicians among the Muslims, the learned among them. They are speaking about the light of the Prophet. You know, what the idea of the Prophet, shall we say, was in God's consciousness before the creation of the others. That was why the Quran mentioned there is a covenant with the Prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a covenant, an agreement with the prophets. That's in the Quran, in the Surah Ali Imran. There it is said that God had taken covenant from the prophets, from Noah, the prophet Noah, from the prophet Ibrahim, from the prophet Musa, and from the prophet Isa. What is this covenant? God said to them, there will come a messenger after you who will confirm the truth of what you bring. Now will you also not confirm the truth of what he brings? And will you not also support? Yes. Will you not believe? The Quran is not believe. Don't you believe in that? And they all agree. The other they said, we testify. We agree. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that verse said, I am one of the witnesses to you all. This is a very serious agreement. Now, obviously, we must understand the verse not referring to, to, to those prophets who were living in those periods. Yes? But referring, referring to a prophet that will come later. Those earlier prophets were no longer there. Therefore, it was referring to their followers. In other words, those earlier prophets are asked to tell their followers about this so that their followers will continue to expect <coughs> and which they did according to their agreement. <coughs> then in another verse later in the, another surah if I'm not mistaken the off or the Ahzab the surah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again this time to the Prophet Muhammad, again reminded that we have made an agreement, very serious agreement with the Prophets, with Noah, with uh, Ibrahim, with Musa and with Isa, and now with you, Waminka, the Quran said, referring to him. 
And the same thing, which, which he did, the Prophet Muhammad acknowledged and supported and affirmed the truth of what the earlier prophets promised. The earlier prophets also had made an agreement affirming what he was, the messenger who is going to come. Now some modern, well, some orientalists obviously, they will say it has nothing to do with uh, the Prophet Muhammad. They might say like that. They might say what it means is that after the Prophet know, maybe there will be another Prophet coming and that Prophet will tell this, will confirm the Prophet know. Then after the Prophet Ibrahim, another Prophet will come and confirm the Prophet Ibrahim. And so on like that. Yes? In other words, it's not the Prophet Muhammad we are talking about, is it? It's about many different prophets. And not only that, some went further to say that if you go on like that, it means there yeah, are some Muslim scholars talking like this, saying that it means that after, in other words, the prophecy will come after every prophet. It does not end with the Prophet Muhammad, in spite of the fact that the Quran itself speaks about him being the last prophet, the seed of the prophet. So you say there is something wrong with the mind of the Muslim today. Why are they not aware of all this? Anyway, like they are not taught properly. The education system, something is wrong with that. They are too preoccupied with other things. They assume that they already know Islam, no need to teach. Islam is just the five prayers, this, Kalima Shahada, and the five. <laughs> That's what they think it is. Yes? And the prayers, well, of course, that is simple for people to understand and to do. These are things we practice. But what about the Arkanul Iman? What about those things uh, which are not tangible, which are not, uh, which are not clear to a lot of people, especially at this time? Because these are the things that are being gradually challenged by another civilization, by the West. Yes. They are talking about God. They are talking about now, uh, about they also believe in God. Uh, we are not denying that. Yes. We are saying, yes, we believe in God. They now also say, we believe in one God. Our Hindus also say, yes, they believe in one God. There is only one Brahma. Yes. The, the Jews say the same thing. So some Muslims get confused thinking that in that case, what is the difference? That all of them believe in one God. So it's very clear that Obviously, all mankind will believe in God, yes? in whatever form they believe Him in their mind. But because all mankind has already witnessed this God before He became human, when He was still in the state, spiritual state. God had already made a covenant with mankind, saying, Don't you recognize me? Who I am? Am I not your God? And mankind had answered, Yes, indeed, we acknowledge. That is the reason why there are religions, you know, because all of them are trying to, to, to think what this is about. But his nature, whether his oneness, this one, of course, there are differences. So that some of them are correct, and some of them. The Muslim will say that the, the revelation of the Quran makes things clear. The others do not have a revelation like that. The Bible is not the same as the Quran. The Jewish testaments also are not the same. The Hindus, of course, they, they don't even have an idea of prophecy, of Nabuwa. The Chinese don't even have this thing. Therefore you cannot call Confucius a prophet, like some Muslims are trying to call him. There, there is no idea about prophecy. 
it was not something about prayer. It was something about maybe adab, about politics, about how to. That's what he was talking about. As for the Hindus, they had many. So in other words, we are not the same as all these other religions. We are not, of course, we are not supposed to insult them. We are not supposed to belittle them. We are not supposed to say they are wrong. We, we tolerate them. We accept them. But this does not mean that to do that, we have to admit by saying, yes, it's the same God. I know it is the same God. Ultimately, it is the same God. Although they are not realizing it. Since there is only one God, other gods are just mental construct. They don't exist. They exist in the imagination, in the mind of people who imagine them. But there is only one God, one reality. So, of course, they will admit that. Even Satan admits that. Yes? So, even Iblis admits that. That he said in the Quran, he said, I am afraid of Allah. And Ibni, he said, Ibni, Akhotun Moha Rabbal Alamin. Ibni said, I am afraid of Allah, the Lord of the world. So Iblis acknowledges that there is this one God of all. So, but why do you say Iblis? It is because he disobeyed. Because he was arrogant. Because in a sense, his belief, there is something wrong with it. It's a misbelief. Because if you really believe, then you obey. So in other words, this is all, to my mind, an analogy to show that religions are not the same. <clears throat> because a person can believe in God, but at the same time can still be wrong, isn't it? If that belief is not guided by the revelation, just like the Greek philosopher Aristotle, he also, in his writing, he said that there is only one God. But his idea of this one God is, is only an intellectual construction and, and on which there is no practice. He does not put it into practice. He cannot put it into practice. It's just a speculation. And so there are many others also. Other people, even among Muslims. There might be people who call themselves Muslim, but who in their minds do not have a proper conception of what being a Muslim is. So, um, about this worldview, it is very important for Muslims to begin to try to understand and also to, to understand, of course, is how can we understand if this is not taught anyway. This kind of thing should not just be taught in school. It should be taught in higher institutions of learning. And that is what I was trying to do, Dr. Wan, before, yes? The ISTA, it is a graduate institution because you cannot talk about these things at the lower level. You have to talk about these things at the higher level so that this higher level can gradually um, lower, lower, lower down and teaching like that. Uh, but no Muslim university is talking about this thing. No? about the Qur'an, is it the speech of God? They are sometimes charity things. And even the modernists, originally they are talking about this, the Qur'an being created. Until the Muslim were very angry, finally he changed his mind. But at first he talked like that, he said it's created. Although Muslim believe that the Qur'an, the word of God, the word of God is not created. It is his attribute, his sifa. So and then later on, of course, they make excuse. They say, oh no, I mean, I mean the, 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 the ink, the paper, 
the book that you are writing this thing on. That is very important. Well, we are not talking about that. When we speak about the Quran, we know what we are talking about, about the meaning that underlies what is in that book. The kind of understanding, the, 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 the conception, the knowledge that is there. And that was brought to us to the Prophet. Without the Prophet influencing it, without the Prophet's own um, language, it is not in the language of the Prophet. The language of the Prophet was Arabic, but the Quran language is a new kind of Arabic which did not exist before. Some words are, are there. But there are certain not, they are not there before. So it is not something created by the Holy Prophet. And yet some of the Muslims today, they think as if the Quran also is. The Prophet must have written all this. Indeed, I, mean, I may not be saying this, but without mentioning, you know, there, are, there were leaders among the Muslims. He said, you know, that this going to the Hajj is just a means for economic, the Arabs, for their economic advancement. Yes. And there was somebody else beside him said, but this is in the Quran. And then he said, okay, but the whole Quran also, who writes that? You see, the implication behind that. So in other words, <laughs> If you find people like this and they call themselves Muslims, something is wrong. <laughs> and sometimes these people are in positions of responsibility, of power and accountability. And therefore they should not be talking like that. <clears throat> Recently even one of our previous leaders was saying that in Malaysia, talking about liberalism. In Malaysia, women can do anything they like. I was reported in the papers like that, whether he actually said it like that, but he said, in Malaysia, women can do anything they like. That's not true, of course, isn't it? They cannot do anything they like. So, I mean, you, you must think before you speak, especially when you are a leader. <laughs> And you must not say, and you must not say, for example, oh, we can pray the Kaaba behind us, or the Qibla. The same leader was saying, we can pray the Qibla behind you. I think that not the right way. What he means is that in some cases, when there is a war or battle or something in a state of fear, you are running away, you, you say a certain prayer, that prayer, sometimes you don't know, the Qibla is behind you, that's what he meant. But don't say it like that. But if you say, you can pray with the Qibla behind you, it means you know it is behind you. Yes. So in other words, you have to say that words are very important. And, and especially the leaders must say things, I think, which which will not confuse those who are led. And nowadays I think many things have become, become confused. And, and we are trying to help by, by talking, but sometimes we might talk in a way that, that <laughs> might not be approved. But what other way? Sometimes we talk nicely, they not listen. We talk in this way, not this, and we write clearly, not this. Therefore, we talk like this, and then we are scolded for that. <laughs> they speak about Adam and so on. They don't realize that it is they who, whose Adam is one thing, because they are dealing with things about which they are not aware. Yes? And they must not treat people who understand what they are saying as if they are nobodies, that they should not listen to them. This is not the way how to treat people. So, 
In other words, <clears throat> about Ajar also, if this is one of the important elements, fundamental elements in that worldview of Islam, it has to do with education, with the spread of knowledge. Because having knowledge only without practicing that knowledge, then this is useless. Useless to the person, in other words, who has it. Like what Al Ghazali said about the man who was blind and he has a candle and he moves about in this dark cave with this candle. Of course, he is blind, he doesn't see the light. But, but others who follow him, who are not blind, they benefit from him. So in other words, <clears throat> in other words, we have to, the question of other, therefore is the, the right action, when you do things right and correct, right, not just correct, but right, ethically, Morally, right, that's what it is. And then, <clears throat> to do right action, you must have knowledge. Of knowledge of right and wrong, obviously. Without that knowledge, how can you do what is right? So, but if you have the knowledge, you do the right. And you not only do the right, you, you also you also correspond your actions with that rightness. Then you are doing adab to yourself. And then, not only that, because of that, you are creating a state of harmony within you, which is called justice. You are being just to yourself, the Quran said, because you have put yourself in, in your right place. So, in other words, this all requires knowledge, knowledge about ethics. And yet today, for example, Western thought, which has influenced us also, they are talking now about values. And values, some of them, have, have nothing to do with ethics. Yes. Certain values, of course, they said they are values that have to do with ethics, are the one dealing with goodness, with uh, and this is problematic for them. How do we know uh, this value called goodness? Do we make the valuation? In other words, if you talk about value, you think there is someone who values it. Therefore, they are questioning all this. They are saying, in, in, in that case, it is subjective then. Yeah. And therefore, is there such a thing as value that is absolute? Not because you value it, but it, is, it has the property of value. Is there such a thing? Of course, question like this, we already have the answer to that. We are saying that all this ethics, justice, yes, wisdom, these things are things that are absolute. It's not things that we um, create. This is a thing that was there, whether we like it or not. Yes. <clears throat> so, I think that this question of Adab, you know very well that we have to put things in the proper place, we said, to create justice. But, if you know in our history, and not only our history, other civilizations. People also are to be put in their proper places. The Quran commands that we should give the amana to those to whom they are due. That's a command. And yet we are not following that. Because we don't know. In fact, when I said some of these things to some of our uh, 
When I said this thing before, they said, but how do we know who is um, expert in what? You see? I said, if you ask like that, then it means you don't know. <laughs> that if you don't know, therefore you cannot uh, challenge what we are saying. Therefore, the Quran is Quran. It means they must know. The early Muslim knew. They did not ask the Prophet when the verse was revealed. They did not ask the Prophet, how do we know who is Ahri for what? They all know. They already know. But today the Ummah of Islam has become half confused. They don't know who should be this, who should be that. Yes, so in other words, a fool must take the amana of what? So in our system of government, they must admit that sometimes we are putting the wrong people in the wrong places. In the same thing. In the system of our religious also, we are sometimes putting wrong people in the wrong place. And in the universities also, we are putting wrong people in the wrong place. Because Amana is not there. So if we talk like this, this is the reason why we have not become popular. But we don't intend to be popular. I mean, our intention is not being popular. Yes? We are not film stars wanting to be popular, but we just want to be a concern. We want people to be doing the right thing. The right thing according to our worldview. In other words, whatever we do, it must be within that, that whole framework, not just a little paradigm here and there. <clears throat> So, I think that uh, I have said many things already and maybe some of the things you might want to, to, to make comments on, to, to ask, but if I can, of course I will try to explain. If I can't, then I will tell you that I can't. <coughs> Now, about this worldview, therefore, you cannot leave this to to politicians or to legalists, money and the drama dealing just with the law. You cannot reduce Islam to fake it, which is what is happening in the Muslim world today. Yeah. As a fake is what Islam is. The word mulama also refers to actually not only fukaha, but they are not even fukaha. They are what you call the mukalwin, the ones who are tackling on the fukaha. Yes. So, in other words, Islam is wider than that. And what we are saying is that Islam, this fake is important. It is, it is something that must be taught to all Muslims also. Yeah, but all Muslims already know. For example, we know already the rules and regulations about prayer, about fasting, about going to the hut, all this. So in other words, that, other than that, there are some problems which are ambiguous. Uh, sometimes the modern um, ulama is not trained to understand these things or to give judgments on this thing. So sometimes they make mistakes. So in other words, even the great Ulama, the Imam of the past said that sometimes they also mistake, but in most cases they don't make mistakes. Yes. So in other words, <clears throat> we have to understand this and that ultimately our problem cannot be solved by them by political means or by legal means, we cannot solve this problem because it is a problem of knowledge. And of course, they still, even knowledge is, is misunderstood. They think it is information now, with the internet and all these things. But information is not knowledge. 
Only when you interpret the information correctly, that interpretation becomes knowledge. But now you have even knowledge management. You see? As if knowledge is just something you manage instead of you being managed by knowledge. Okay? So in other words, <laughs> when we speak about the problem of Muslim, as I said many times, more than 30 years ago, 40 years almost, I said the loss of Adab, but I mean the loss of the ability to know the right place and to to put yourself in the right place, then that knowledge is lost. And because of that, there is, there is injustice. Because justice in Islam is based on knowledge, right and wrong, without which you cannot know. Even in, in Western law also, it must be based on knowledge. But you can't say that to be just, you must be impartial. That not quite correct. That is not justice. That is a procedure that should lead to justice. But it is not justice. Because, as because of that, most of us in various fields, even in politics, in the educated universities, whenever we are confronted with problems of this and that, then uh, no, I must be impartial. The man who is supposed to be the, the, what do you call it? I ah, must be impartial. Now, impartiality means you are neither on this side nor on that side. That means you don't know. <laughs> you, you don't know which side is right. That's what it is. So how can you say that this is justice? Justice is when you know who is right. And you side with that. You can't be impartial. You must decide. So that's what's supposed to happen in courts. The judge, of course, he begins by being impartial. He listens to this lawyer, the defendant, he listens to the litigant, the lawyer, he sees all the evidence. So at that stage, the judge does not have yet the knowledge of right and wrong. The judge does not know Therefore, he has to be impartial in order to listen to both sides, to examine everything. But once he has seen and heard and examined, then he decides that this is right and that is not. Then he gives judgment. At that stage only is justice to be defined. Which means, therefore, that justice is siding with what is right. It's not enough just saying being fair. But being fair is rather vague. You know? Of course, in the, English, in the English law, they speak about justice as being fair. It's precisely because they realize that justice, they don't want to define it. They consider it a problem defining. It's better to leave it undefined. Because every age, every unknown, we have our own definition. Therefore, leave it open. Leave the mind open. So many important concepts are not defined purposely. They don't want to define good. Because there many people, different people give different answers to this. Therefore, how do we know what all this is? How can we know what really is good and good? Unless we return to the revelation. That is to say, revelation means the Wahi, that is the Quran. In other words, that should be the guide. One should discover, one should discover the, the what you call it, principles from the Quran. Not just the legal one. That already people have done. But what about other things? The same with the hadith of the Prophet. All the hadith of the Prophet, that you know, a lot of this are from the legal side. And therefore they said you must have, yes. Because, because you must have three authors of hadith who are reliable. In order to, because this has got to be put into practice. Yes. But yet, don't think that this is the way how we should treat the hadith of the prophet. 
Just like the Quran, the Hadith also have got, have got tafsir, have got interpretation, have got inner meaning. And the Prophet did not just talk about law. The Holy Prophet did not just talk about haram and halal. In fact, a great deal of what he says are more than what about halal and halal. He talks also about, for example, about, about simple things, about everyday life, about hygiene, about brushing the teeth, about covering the utensils for your food, about how to drink properly, about eating, about washing hands. This simple, simple, then about, about uh, medical things. Therefore, there are some habits we classify under the medical or medicine. Then you have more and more than you have philosophical habits dealing with uh, matters that are philosophical. They are dealing with the metaphysical things. They are dealing with God. They are dealing with science. Hadith about what is this world? What is the nature of this world? So all these things, therefore, the Hadith has not yet been classified like that. Now, it's only just mean a lot of legal. But the Hadith is not a lot of legal. The Hadith reports the books of Bukhari and Muslim and others contain a lot of this. But the legal people, they only take the legal side. And they, they forget about the other. About women. Did the Prophet not say about toleration about women? The Prophet did not denigrate women. Yes. He said that women are between the house of men. He said that heaven lies at the feet of mothers. He said many things also about women. But why are these hadith not said? Instead, what is being said are hadith that are, what do you call it? Problematic. In other words, the Prophet also, when he spoke this hadith, obviously he was speaking to a certain audience. We have to understand that too. If he said, this world is a, is a prison, for the true believers, but it is paradise to the unbelievers. And the modern writers will obviously not have it, they will say. Yes. Because they are afraid of people interpreting that the world is a prison. This is not hadith. So gradually every year they edit the hadith books. They take away what they consider to be unacceptable and then they produce new books. So the modern day Muslim knows very little about the Hadith. And then when we say this thing, they say it's not in the Hadith books. Yes, because the Hadith books have been, have been re-edited, revised, and many things have been taken away. And yet a lot of these Hadith are found in the dictionaries, not only in the Bukhari, Muslim and all the, the, the Sahih books, but also in dictionaries in the writings of learned people, even in, even in here in the Malay world, in Hamza Fansuri's writing, you find many hadith being said by him, which are not in the hadith book today. Particularly that hadith about <coughs> more the, 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 the philosophical type of hadith, that the prophet was a prophet before Adam was created, things like that. Yes, and, and so in other words, <clears throat> there is the, one of the problems is that we have to the, the prophet that his words have got many meanings. We have to understand whom he was talking to. When he said this word is prison, he was talking obviously to people who understood him. And some of these people, the Hare Sopa, the one who, who uh, like the Sufis, the one who are close to him, who, <laughs> who, who are all the time very up and thinking about this thing. So he is talking to them. So they understand what he means. He is not talking to the economists who will say this is nonsense. If you say the world is a prison, then we are backward. That's why we are not progressive. <laughs> yeah, but it is true. Those who know and understand the world, they know that that is true. Mm. 
So in other words, the interpretation of the Hadith also like the Quran has got a tafsir <laughs> as well as a ta'wil. So the Quran, the same thing. Even the, the fisherman, I remember in, in, in Pahan before. Even the fisherman understands that if you say that God is the life of the heavens and earth, they understood by a life it doesn't mean these lives. That means somehow they have some sort of uh, understanding. And yet some of our professors when talking about God being the life, oh yes, these atoms and all this, these are all. You see, why must you talk like this? Obviously, there are some things that are clear, some things that are not clear. And the Quran says, leave the not clear to those who know, to the people who are experts in that, and not devil with this thing. So, I think we must also understand that secularization is is the external problem, challenge that we are facing. But this secularization, secular, there are many meanings to that. In other words, we are not opposed to secular if it means just being preoccupied with this world. Because, because we, we are supposed to be preoccupied with this world, yes, in our life here. We are not opposed to that, but what we are opposed to is I many times think secularization as an ideology, as a philosophical program, saying that there is no God and there are no other world, there is only this world, and that we are changing all the time, and change is necessary. And that uh, we create our own law, and that we also change, and because of that, therefore, we must leave open for future change. And all values and ethics also ultimately will have to change. Now, this kind of secularization is the one that we all do. In other words, in our case now here in Malaysia, for example, people call that we are a secular state, but there is nothing wrong with that because we are not opposed to religion. <laughs> We are, we are teaching religion in school. We are, what do you call this? Not opposed to religious education. Yes. But, but secularization is an ideology, a philosophical program. They are opposed to this. They are saying that these things are ultimately they'll have to go. Depending upon the level of development of people. So I think these are some of the things I'm only unsatisfactorily, I mean, simplifying a lot of things. But I hope that you will, maybe you might question things or might make your comments. Because I think this subject of worldview is, is a very big subject. I cannot, I cannot uh, out of respect for knowledge, I cannot just uh, simplify it like this. Yes. I, in other words, I'm talking, I'm touching here, touching there, like that. So I hope you will understand that. And about the Holy Prophet also. I hope that all the Muslim people, they have to understand who the Holy Prophet was and is. And yet, Muslims today, I think, are more than talking very much about it. And they, I'm not talking about the history of Makkah at the time, this are all we thought, I know that. They are written in books. But what about the one not written in the book, like what I said just now? That how his companions in his lifetime, how they regard him. They don't just call him O oh, Muhammad. Like what uh, such a school of Muslim thought. I say, no, just call him Muhammad. After all, he's a man like you and I. He's just a paper order. And so, 
He is not like that. I mean, in his time, even when he has his hair cut, people rush to take that hair and some of them even teeth and the nails. And the woman who put the bottle where he was, while he was resting, taking a nap, with perspiration, she put that bottle in his neck and he woke up and he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm taking your perspiration. I want to keep it for posterity. So you see, you see how the people in his time regard him. Not like any human beings on earth. And yet he was a human being. And Muslims are not confused, they are not making him to God. Like the Christian can see the Jesus. So in other words, therefore he, he to, to, to understand this worldview, to become close to Islam, you have to begin with the Holy Prophet. And even he said, he then said that he is the, the citadel of knowledge. And therefore, it's only through him that we, that we also are, what you call, united as a, as, as an ummah, as a community. He is the one who really happening, gave us our identity. Now, in other words, there is no, no person like him in other civilizations. No person treated in that manner. No person is an example for little children, for young person, adults, and for men, for middle age, for elderly people, for men as well as women. There is no person like that. Therefore, in their case, they have to change from time to time. And none of their great thinkers, they are really, they are not. They are not really examples, except in only certain things. Perhaps the Buddha is an example in terms of trying to, to control one's self, moral, ethical. That's an example of that, but not an example necessarily in life, because I think he left his family. Yes? He left his wife. That we are not asked to do that. <laughs> because, so in other words, and Jesus cannot be an example to the Christians, or he can't be God, so from their point of view, he cannot be an example. But the he didn't marry, that's the reason why the early Catholics and so on, the priests were not supposed to marry, trying to follow his example. But then, if you really follow that example, there will be no Christianity. In the first generation. <laughs> so in other words, we have to understand this. We have to say all the thought. Also of all the leaders of religion, I think he was the one who was most criticized, especially by the Europeans, by the Orientalists. They criticized him, they write books against him, they did all kinds of things. From, even from the early period, even perhaps before even the rise of Islam. Because some of them already know. But the Quran mentioned that Jesus spoke to his disciples about the coming. And then he gave his name also, his name, Ahmad. That means they already know about that. They know about the coming of Islam. Because some of them, they said we have to, I mean the ones who are ambitious, the same fall, especially. Of course if we talk like this, uh, outside to them, I think it's not. But we have to understand that. We don't have to talk outside, we don't have to talk to them about it. But we have to understand and know so that we know who we are. We are not concerned about these things. We are only we only hope we can help them also if they ask for it. We have we have compassion towards people who want to believe.
but who sometimes are misled by their leaders, by their religious leaders. So in other words, we speak of toleration, not really tolerate, but because tolerate does not include compassion. But we are speaking about, about, about being compassionate, being helpful, being respectful. All this is urged in the Quran and in the Hadith. Remember that was the Sunnah of the Hadith in which the Prophet, one day he was sitting with companions in a funeral passed by and he got up and then one of the companions said, Why did you get up? That's, that's a Jew who died. So he answered, Is he not the possessor of a soul? So in other words, if you should, these are all examples that we should emulate. <clears throat> so I think, if, if I may say so, perhaps I should, I should, uh, I should stop my talk, and but I should listen to what you have to ask and try to answer. I'm very sorry that I did not, uh, I just to talk like this, impromptu as it were, and uh, that, that is because, because as I said, I think this is a, it's a very big subject. I can only say little things here and there and point out some of our problems, but uh, I cannot go into detail. In fact, in detail, well, this is only in that book. For those of you who read and understand, it is all there. In fact, when I read this, uh, the theme of this, today's <coughs> seminar, that is uh, the revival of the world view and external and internal challenges, all these things are already said in that book in page 1 to page 20. All of them are there and answered. You see? And even more than that, because in there we talk about other things as well. <coughs> So I leave it there. Thank you very much. Of course, we are many of you here, and there are only one or two microphones out there. Uh, it's better, perhaps, if you want to ask questions, you ask it very precisely and don't make long comments. Uh, and those who want to write, please write clearly and, and shortly. I'll, I'll allow the gentleman near us to my first In the course of your lecture, Prof, you mentioned that it is essential that the right people should be in the right place for us to do the right thing. In the present situation of the Muslim world, do you think the right people, I mean the politicians, do you think the politicians are the right people to lead mostly out of the present predicament. Okay, the, you are asking that that the, that we think the politician and the right people to lead mostly to lead the Muslim out of the present predicament, the conversion of in terms of an ideological problem in the Muslim world, in terms of definition of identity as Muslims in the Muslim world relative to other parts of the world. So do you think the politicians, they have the capability, they have the, to the, uh, the Islamic uh, basis to rule and tell us what to do? Yes. Okay, now thank you know the answer already. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm asking to ask, I'm asking to, to comment on his views. 
God is only, uh, it's not a name. I said, oh, God is a name of this being whom we call God. And in fact, of a being whom even higher than what you call to be God. And for the moment I said, oh, God is not the assembly. It's not a national language. It belongs to the language of all the children of the world. That's why your argument about using this. But the moment of God does not fit into your idea of God. Because of God does not have one son, he is not one of three, he is not a thing to come in the place of a saving. So that is the reason why out of respect to our God, we can allow you to sort of use it. But when we, Muslim, when we arrive in English, we say God, or when we talk to people, we say God, we mean God. Okay. But they, they cannot say that they are also meaning God, because they are not meaning God. Okay. So, I think in this particular respect, we have to be clear, and not the uh, was was and our, whoever is responsible in our government, they have to be clear what they have to explain. We are not asking, we are not wanting you to, we agree, you want to use God, we use two hands, we also use that. Yes, we also use that. But we understand in Malay language, two hands is not a translation of Allah. That's why we say, Tiada Tuhan, Melayukan Allah. Not Tiada Tuhan, Melayukan Tuhan. <laughs> we always say there is no God but God. <laughs> so in other words, at least, the early ulama and the Muslim race, we understand already the meaning of that. So Allah is, cannot be translated. No language is translated from God. The Arabs themselves, they only use that after Islam. Although the word existed, the Christian Arabs, they also don't really use Allah. If they say that, it's just a language, they are talking about language. Because they say Allah is something like, like the Muslim when they, when they, yes. But, but they are not doing it. So it, it appears that they really want to do that in order to confuse the Muslims into thinking that and to have that all the same. That's why I say one of the problems about religion, about the nature of God, about who Allah is, that's why our family man, the first thing is Amana Bila. Who is this Allah? So, and, and that needs to be explained at higher institutions and learning in a proper way to the right sort of so to this, to this, I think we have already answered this question by saying that <clears throat> it is not proper to allow them to use this if they are asking us. And there is no point trying to bring it to court because, because it is not a matter for the court to decide okay, whether they can do it or not, whether they have the freedom to do this or not. It is up to the Muslims. But then if they use, they say Indonesia has used it, why can't we? Well, that is because the Muslims, if the Muslims don't care, then they will go on using it. In Indonesia, of course, they are using not only that, other things, they even call it in the choir, Salawat. Choir is for the Salawat, Salawat is for the prophet. It's not saving in a hymn. And then they even talk about this. In Indonesia, for them, they also are confused. Muslim, that's why this thing happened. Really, sometimes the language, even when you come across English, would term like prophet of doom. In Indonesia, they call it Nabi Shalapa. <laughs> How can there be a Nabi Shalapa? 
what is meant by prophet of doom in English. The word prophet in English does not mean Nabi only. It means yang meramalkan malah petaka. That's what it means. So prophet of doom means the yang meramalkan malah petaka. What you can say, ultimately, they say, well, that means you are saying, God is not a God. Well, if you want to use the word God, we are saying, yeah, we also do the word God, we are the word God, God, because we know. And we are, we are not saying that your, ultimately your God is also ultimately the word of God. You cannot run away from the God. You cannot escape it. And so in the, Quran says, Quranul Bumatina, Malikina, Irahina. Allah is still really that He loves them. He is saying, He is saying, I am really the real Irah of Mas. Although mankind, of course, is not interpreting it that way. By the way, I receive a lot of uh, a lot of questions, so I'm summarizing them and try to combine the question together. Yes, this just now I touched only very little bit about possible your question that do you recommend Muslim to join two free orders? No, I am not recommending that <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of these two free orders nowadays. Some of them are not very really superish in the first place. They are after worldly things. And this is far from what Tasawu is talking about. And Tasawu is not just a matter of order, wearing baju, wearing turban, wearing... That's not what Tasawu is. They themselves say it is the haraka, not the khirka, that make the sufi sufi. Okay. So in other words, or in other words, uh, no, we should not be yeah, because a lot of them are suspect. And also, it will not lead you anywhere. Sometimes they make you feel as if you are more, more important than other Muslims. And that will be this Nowadays, this all is all around. You want to learn about this thing, you must learn from, from a teacher who knows. Yes, but this teacher who knows does not necessarily have to be in a Sufi order. A lot of them don't know. A lot of them don't understand the inner doctrines. They cannot interpret them. That a great Sufi, even Arabi himself said. He said a lot of them are using Sufi terms. They will say verses from what the Sufis say. And yet, he said, you are to know the truth from the false, ask them to interpret. It's very easy to say, man arafa nafsa, tawad arafa rabba. Okay. Ask them, what does this mean? Interpret. Give a tafsir of this. And usually they cannot. They cannot be correct or be the wrong tafsir. And some of them were good. I remember when I was a young man before, I was doing some research on the Sufi orders in Malaysia. There were nine of these tarikas that I, 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 what do you call it? I know that they are yeah, shared. And when I talked to them about this thing, they admitted they don't know. But I said, as long as you don't do these things, that's okay. As long as you teach people to be good people and perform things correctly, to be good human beings, then fine, but don't talk about things you don't know. In other words, you don't prevent secret knowledge. <laughs> because even in Sajjah Raya, you find that when that book called the Toro Manjong arrived in Malacca, it was sent to Pasai to be interpreted. And then somebody there was asking a question like this. Yes, about, about, 
the one who really rule. And therefore, we have Christians, we have Hindus, we have Buddhists, we have Confucians. Therefore, therefore, this is the nice, fertile, breeding ground for this kind of idea. So in other words, because the politician, I'm sorry to say, might be influenced by this, and I hope that they, they won't. They might be, and they will be saying, yes, all religions are the same. They cannot do that. Because if they do that, they will be troubled. And if they don't want trouble, they won't do that. Don't say it in fact. You remember this one happened, if I might remind you, in the time of when Tun Hussein was the Prime Minister. I think he said, when you are in one of those uh, Indian, I think the Babali, he said, yes, you are Subramanian. Yes, Subramanian. You call him Subramanian? We call him also. Yes, as if, as if no difference. I think he even mentioned all road lead to Rome. <laughs> Why to Rome? To tell the truth, all road lead to Mecca also. All road lead to Kuala Lumpur also. The world is not. <laughs> but to say that like that is not right. It is wrong. And because of that, and then who also people, you see they used to go to the Batu Cave to light candles and so on. I, I've been advising them, please don't do this. Because they will be done. No. And then you have that Bali. Is it Bali? Uh, yeah. Yes, when, where, where you have some people who destroyed idols and were killed by them. And that, that, that is dangerous. Therefore you can't talk like this. Because there, there might be some people who cannot hold their passion and emotion. Simple people. So then they become extremists. Don't say anything. Just say thank you very much. If they invite you to open this temple, just say thank you. I can't do that. It's not my tradition. Then if they want to come and open and go into the mosque, you can say, no, you cannot do this. Unless, of course, you take off your shoes, you want to just go and see mine, but you can join us in our room and prayers. Yes? So why must you be doing this? We must be firm with this, so that we understand. I think in Singapore, those people understood. The government there, they understood. When there was that tsunami uh, disaster, then they asked people to all, you know, to take candles and sing hymns. If the Muslim there told the ministers, Singapore, saying that this is not our custom. We don't mind if we just say one minute silence to them. But not holding candles and, and singing hymns. Singapore was the oh yes, fine. So in other words, good leaders will follow this. They must listen to this. Because we are not wanting to follow them. We don't ask them, can we use your terms, your religious terms? We are not doing that. We don't use other people's religious terms, we use our own. And therefore we don't allow us, other people to take our own. Why? Yeah. <clears throat> so I think this is the... Uh, sorry, so there are so many. <laughs> Another question you ask is how do how do you are asking me how do you teach um, you are asking in general how does one teach the, this this worldview the correct worldview in our universities? Well, obviously you must have. People who know about this. People who are experts. Without that, then you cannot think. You will confuse. If you, if, you, if you give the amana to people who don't know, then you cannot teach this thing. And that is the reason why the universities are not teaching this thing. And if they pretend to teach, then we have to examine that. People who are learning must know what they are saying. 
You cannot just leave the universities, even if it will call him itself an Islamic university. Because sometimes they are also wrong. <laughs> I don't know, I, this is the first time I have heard about you are asking, is it true that the 20 attributes of God is taken from the Greeks? I, who said this? I know, we have Greeks have been trying to speak about these things, but not the 20 attributes. I don't think they are talking about this. Some of the things they are saying is, is similar to what these Greeks are saying. But then, we must understand my answer to that is this. It is not really Greek, some of these things. Because the ancient Greeks, they did not know, they did not receive revelation. But then they were Jews, they were the followers of Nabi Musa. It is from these followers of Nabi Musa they heard about this thing. And they write and they try to explain. Because it's not theirs. So sometimes we think it is Greek. But I think sometimes some of these things are not Greek ideas. They are based on, on revelation given to the earlier prophets. Not their prophets, the Jews. So, but not everything, of course, because the Greeks, what they are trying to do is try to classify, you know, but then that means it's not from them. That's why they ask questions like, what is justice? What is virtue? What is good? They are asking questions like that, which means that they must have heard these terms, this concept from, from revelation from what was taught by God to the prophet. And then they try to interpret what's up. They know they are mistaken, they are wrong. How did Aristotle know that there is one God? How did he come to that idea when he's a pagan? He believed in many gods. How did he write and talk about one God? Where did he hear this from? So obviously he heard it. He must have heard it from the followers of the prophet. Because they were Jews in the, in the ancient times, in the great cities of Athens and so on. <clears throat> so, then the other thing you are asking is, therefore, it is true that the attributes of God now, it is not true, we are talking about the attributes. No, they are, the, the attributes that you are talking about is about the seven that were mentioned in support himself. And then the other seven that are, that are contrary to that, yes? And then the other... So in other words, these are from, from the Quran, not from the Greek. All about the religion of Islam, about having to do with God, the belief, the Iman. This is from the Quran, not from the Greek, not from anyone else. From the Quran. <coughs> and then about assessment of... The, the Islamization of Knowledge Project. I don't think that this has been going on for more than 30 years now, from the time that we talked about Islamization. Until now, it, it is it, it because, the reason is simple, it is because the people who are trying to carry out the project, they don't understand this thing. It's not their idea. They have stolen it from other people. And therefore they cannot develop it. They cannot explain it. Therefore they become wrong. Yes? Some of them even will say, oh, it's not Islamization. It is Islamicization. <laughs> <laughs> You know that you cannot speak about Islamic size. Just like some people, they might be criticizing me because I wrote that 
Waktu punena to the metaphysics of Islam. Anda bisa tahu, tu Islam ni metaphysics, not metaphysics of Islam. This is nonsense because when you speak what your religion, you say religion of Islam, not Islamic religion. Why? Because when you say Islamic, it means you are putting this idea on what you think is Islam. But if you say Islamization, it means Islamization, Islamization, it means as if you are doing something to Islamize your people, whatever it is, as if the thing is outside you. This is not the thing like that. So in other words, it is wrong to speak of Islamization because that means it is it is not Islam. Islam is still is still vague because you are just Islamic. You are you are putting an adjective to it. The Islam itself is the, is not much. But we say Islam is Islamization. We say we say making Islam in other words. Making Islam at all because all Islamization is in your mind, ultimately. Not outside. You may misunderstand. They think, how do you make Islamic bicycle? <laughs> how, how are you Islamizing that the, this thing, the car? The, right? this, they don't understand that. They are not talking about that. In other words, the Islamization is in your mind. And, and Whatever you do, how you understand the vision and so on, like that. the knowledge is in you and not outside you. So the Islamization of knowledge is like that. In other words, you have to know things, in some cases the same like others, but in other cases it's not the same. Well, because, because you are basing yourself on this worldview. This Quran, about the God, about the Quran, the Prophet, about what the Quran says, is on that. that you, are, you, are, you are understanding, knowing. You know what I mean? We are not saying that there is a different way of looking at a cockroach. It's the same, the cockroach is the same cockroach. <laughs> and also, we don't give examples like cockroaches, which some of the sociologists try to give. Because we're not talking about cockroaches. <laughs> we're talking about something bigger than that. I mean, don't therefore caricature. That's not what we mean. So, in other words, first of all, when you say about the project, the translation, I tried to do that. I did not fail. It is the Muslims who fail. You all, the government, they are supposed to be Muslim. They fail. Yes. They destroy the institute that I gave precisely to, in order to, to realize. And we have proven ourselves. We don't need to prove them. We have proven our world. The world acknowledges us. And only that, the building that we build, we are in concrete. Therefore, don't say that, oh, metaphysicians, they are, they are only talking about the sky, not going down to earth. But there is the building in concrete. Now, everything is there, the library is there, all is there. And the, the people, the right people to teach. But all this is suddenly stopped. Why? The Lord of people is suddenly There is something wrong. We must realize that this ethic is very important. And even in business, you remember from the one that when you were writing that book for Eclipse about what they call derailment. In other words, how certain things fail. Now you want to blame the leader. But, you know, if, if a certain business or organization is derailed, meaning failed, don't blame the leader of that because the fact that he is a leader means he is only capable. Otherwise, it will not exist. It is possible that there are other reasons why 
not because he failed, but because of envy. You see? Envy, which is, which is an ethical matter. But then now, modern civilization don't talk about this thing. Ethics. They have separated ethics from values and from uh, management, from business, from ethics is separate. So in other words, sometimes this is a, this should be eradicated. And, and I'm, I think that government should be wiser than listening to all kinds of fitna and envy. Yes? That's what happened. That is what really happened. And I bear witness before God that that is what has happened. Yes? Therefore, therefore, you see why we go on talking like this. Yes. <laughs> you see, you have written many books, how to understand them, how to get an understanding of your ideas, and how to spend your, spread your ideas upon them. But this is a very, very question. But the point is that, you see, supposing you, this book, some of them are written for certain people, I suppose. Of course, you can help if other people live. It, it depends on how you are living. You see, even there are some professors who admit that if they read, they are reading a newspaper, they will not understand what we are saying. Therefore, one has to contemplate. One has to think about the words that I use, what they mean, and not read like, like reading a storybook, because it is not like that. So, ultimately, if you ask how to understand them, then you have to, you have to think about what you are reading. You have to look at them, you have to try to understand the trend of thought that goes on, because, because when I write, I am I'm thinking of words, the correct word. It follows logically my trend of thought. And of course the reader must also try to follow that, to discover that. If not, then they will read 12 times, 20 times, it will still mean nothing to them. But then, another thing is you must have the right people to talk about this thing. You say, how to avoid misunderstanding? The only thing is to discuss this thing. And especially if the writer is still alive, and if you ask him, what do you mean by this, what do you mean by that, he will answer you these things. If he is not there, other people maybe who understand will explain to you. So, and then finally, the, of course, I mean, what we are saying, the writing, as we said, is not men, but just everybody. It's not meant for the, everybody, the street cleaner, the fish monger. These people, I don't, we don't need to talk to them about this thing. And therefore, but I'm sure you are not there, because you are asking this question. <laughs> anyway, the, so that is my answer to that. I think you have, you have just to concentrate, to think about it, and to, to understand the word. You can look at dictionaries and so on and find out why this thing is said like that. Because I feel that what has been written, I'm thinking clearly and carefully and put down my thoughts the way I think. And therefore it is maybe not in the same way as other people like it. I'm not using cliches and this and that to be bending about now all the way. So I think that is the only way. It is not easy also because these matters are not simple matters. Some of the books are, you said, some of the books are also clear. And yet, for example, people are not understanding, not only you. But these so-called scholars, the professors, some of them also don't understand. They will read 10 or 20 times, they still don't understand. And yet, and Something that is not metaphysical, like the Trangana inscription. You see that? 
people don't understand that also. How many years? Until now they don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> that was written in 1971. Yeah. And before that, I mean, for almost 60 years, almost 80 years, yes, people have debated and argued about it. And here we are writing short, but explaining page by page. Do you understand? All things quiet. I am glad to see that in this book that Dr. Wan has produced, at least there is one article there about the Tibetan inscription. And at least they have confirmed it. Which means that at least these people who don't want to understand, because they believe in machines, they don't believe in intelligence. They think machines are more, more correct. And therefore they, they want to, to, to wait. You see, this was written at the time that there were no, I did not use machines, there was no calculator, there was no internet, all this uh, technology we have now. So we are using our just intelligence to come to that. But therefore now they are, they are disrespecting and they are belittling intelligence. Machines, science, technology. Even the book on Masati, the one that I wrote, saying that this is the oldest monumentary. Well, they all to understand. They said, no, this must be a fake. But we have given argument there to show it is not a fake. The argument that I gave was stage by stage. But these people who are saying it's a fake, these are the professors in the university. They're supposed to be. <laughs> To know, yes, to understand, they said it's a play. That means they have not understood what we have said. And therefore to, to prove that it is not a faith, they have to send it to, to England to have it carbon dated to see whether what I say is true or not. So they carbon dated the manuscript and it proved what I said to be true. But then the manuscript is no longer the same. I think it is destroyed because most of the it's become almost like plastic. It becomes almost transparent. It's no longer clear as it was originally. And that's it, because they don't believe the intelligence to reach truth. They think only machine can reach the truth. Yes. So on these matters I think we have to at least have some respect, these are things that God gave to all of us, in fact, in value. Yes? And we have to be that. Instead of denying this, denying that, some of these scholars, they deny this, deny that, simply because they have nothing else to do. <laughs> of course, Alhamdulillah, There are so many more questions and I was informed by Hakim that this is only the beginning of their program. They are going to have more structured program, maybe even a weekly proper course offered by some of our colleagues and scholars in this city. In this city. And as you know, Prof. Nagyar Atas has not been speaking here publicly for the last three years because of ill health and, and other reasons. So, uh, as he has said also many times in this lecture that he has written many of these things in this program, Islam and Secularism and Fugo Suto Mule, in his Allah to all Muslim but anyway, Alhamdulillah, for many of us, it's a, it's a fresh reminder. And for many of you who are younger, younger guys, it's a new introduction to a properly high-level Islamic discourse. So we are very happy that the program has been well received. And we are happy to have uh, Prof. Atab to speak again publicly in this country. Thank you very much for the support. Thank Majlis mengucapkan ribuan terima kasih kepada yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Syed Muhammad Akim Al-Atas dan juga yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Wan Muhammad Nur Wadaw atas kesudian beliau sebentar tadi dalam menarikan majlis dan juga membicarakan syarahan pada hari ini.
Oh, nampak ni tengok cantik sangat ni. Saya kat Dr. Dekat selalu pergi tengok je lah. Saya rasa masa bangga pun dah kalah ni. Kuasa ibu seorang profesor menenggelamkan kuasa khas diberikan kepada musuhan dia saya. Nah, secara ringkasnya beginilah. Agak ramai, agak ramai, ramai di kota press lah ini. Berbagai pelbagai semua di pelbagai karya, kata pusat press, kata pelang. Atau ada yang lain. Ada yang lain. Di minta Ini lagi tempatnya Pembunan Demonstrasi ke mana Saya memang tak nak bawa dulu Sebab lagi ruang dulu aku Terima kasih sekarang Uh, walaupun di mana pun selepas ini uh, dijemput yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Syed Muhammad Hakim Alatas Yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Ruan Muhammad Nur Mandaun Yang berhormat Dr. Syed Muhammad Nur Mandaun Ibu Gorma yang lain Untuk menikmati juara PLP di Bidik Sejahtera Dan kepada sikap hari ini Maka ada bukit juara yang disediakan di belakang sana Kerana kita bolehlah kita menikmati juara Sampai bertemu dengan Amin Rokok di datang itu Saya risau Amin Rokok di tempat ini Saya akan kembali Kita dah kembali Kalau anda boleh saya kembali Untuk selesai Saya nak ibu Boleh itu saya serahkan kembali Kepada pihak yang itu Sekian terima kasih